Well, over the last several weeks, we've been trying to make this point and, um, and, and, and operate with that this point will get into the depths of our hearts and our minds and that we would be renewed in the spirit of our minds and come in line with this truth. That all, everything concerning redemption, everything concerning your life, every good thing that God has concerning you and concerning the church is already done and it is already finished. It is already done and we must fully grasp that fact. It takes the struggle out of faith. It is already done. Say that with me. It is already done. For that reason, Jesus said in John chapter 19 and verse 30, he said, it is finished. Everything related to, 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 to salvation, everything related to redemption is finished. In, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 3, it says the works of the Lord were finished from the foundations of the world. They were finished. That means it's done. Colossians chapter 1 verse 12 and 13 says that you were, that says, says that um, says that we have been delivered past tense from the kingdom of darkness and we have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Amen. It says, in other words, past tense we are delivered from the kingdom of darkness and we are, have been delivered and we've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Again, it says in Ephesians 1 and verse 7 that in him we have redemption. It's a reality. It's not something we're trying to do. We're not something we're trying to persuade God on. Redemption is already so. For all that it entails, redemption is already so. The healing, the wholeness, the preservation, the deliverance, the divine protection, the prosperity, it's already done. Freedom from the curse, it's already done. And for that reason, you have scriptures like Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 that says we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Now, we really need to get a hold of the fact that it is done because it changes your perspective. Concerning your own life, concerning the church, all that God has for the church, all that the church needs has already been provided, and we are reaching for, for what God has already provided by faith. And by faith, we are taking what is already a reality in the realm of the Spirit and making it a reality in our lives. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, this is not a ship scripture we've shared uh, recently, but it says, He who had saved us and has called us with a holy calling. He has called us with a holy calling. In fact, part of that holy calling that He's called us with, the Bible says in Hebrews, I believe, chapter 3 and verse 1, that we are partakers of the calling that is on Jesus' life. And right now, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. Amen? And we are seated with Him. Jesus is a high priest. Over all things to the church, we are kings and priests. He is the king of kings, and we are kings. Hallelujah. We are partakers of his calling. No wonder it will say that as he is, so are we in this world. Anyway, 2 Timothy 1 verse 9 says, Who had saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, not according to our qualifications, not according to our academic ability or our background, but according to... To his own purpose and his own grace. According to his own purpose and grace which was given us in Christ Jesus. He's called us according to his own purpose, his own design, his own plan. Because he does everything according to his own counsel. It says in Ephesians chapter 1. And grace which was given us. And he has given us grace in Christ Jesus to be and to become all that he intended. So we have every grace. Amen. So again, the emphasis is that, is that um, it's already done. The next point that we also needed to get a hold of, if we were to reflect back on Ephesians 1 and verse 3, is that God has blessed us, past tense, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Every spiritual blessing in Christ. Which means, and, and, and regarding these spiritual blessings that Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 1 in Christ, Paul wanted us to so God, well, Paul wanted us to get a hold of this for that reason, for us to know what we already have. What are these spiritual blessings that he prayed for us, that God would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation, that the eyes of our understanding would be opened, so that we would know what is the hope to which God has called us, and that we might know what is the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And what are the riches of his glory? And what is the exceeding power that he's, been, that he's placed on the inside of us 
that is even according to the power that raised Jesus from the dead. Amen? So, Paul wanted us to know that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing. How many? Every. Every means each and every single one. Every blessing that there is. We have found out the favor of God is a blessing, so it includes that. We have found out that um, healing is a blessing, so it includes that. The love of God is a blessing. The fruits of the Spirit are blessings, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. The gifts of the Spirit are blessings. The, 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 the Bible says this new man has been created in righteousness and true holiness. They are all blessings, and we have received every spiritual blessing. Now, the fact that we have all things and that we have every spiritual blessing, that is a reality. That is a reality in the realm of the Spirit. That is a reality to God. That is the truth. And that is what Jesus was referring to when he says, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. That's a reality. But he also went on to say, you got to know the truth before you can experience that reality. In other words, you've been made free indeed, but you got to know the truth, and the truth will make you free. In other words, full freedom is a reality. Full liberty is a reality. The fullness of grace and all these things are reality. But we, they must become a reality to us as we get revelation, as we get the truth, and as the word of God comes to us, faith is born, faith is, it rises up within us and gets a hold of what God is saying, what God has said, what God has done. Amen? And who we are, and then as faith gets a hold of that and, and, and embraces it, it becomes a reality to us. But that is very important. Now, the very nature of your born-again spirit, the Bible says, is the very nature of Christ. And all that is in Christ is in your born-again spirit. For that reason, the Bible says that, 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 we have that um, the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Christ. Amen? And then Christ dwells in us. Well, if the fullness of Godhead dwells in Christ and Christ dwells in us, then the fullness of the Godhead must also dwell in us. Amen? And the Bible says, do you not know that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. You become one with God. Just like Jesus says, I and the Father are one. I in him and him in me. So you and I are one, Jesus says. You and me and I in you. That we've been made one. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. First Corinthians chapter one, 6 and verse 17. He's we one. And in fact, your life is, it is no longer you that live, but it's Christ that lives in you. And the life that you now live, you live by the faith of the Son of God. You have the very life of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the confident expectation that you ought to have of every good and every perfect thing that God has come into pass in your life. Christ, who is your life. Colossians chapter 3 says, your life is hid with Christ in God. Now if something is hid, if, 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 um, if, okay, if this, wonderful, valuable pearl of great price. If this pearl is hidden in, 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 in this um, container, what do you call those things you put jewelry? In this jewelry box. For you to find the pearl, you're going to have to find the jewelry box. Locate the jewelry box, you locate the pearl. Well, when you look, your life is hid with Christ in God. Amen? Your life is hid with Christ in God. So for you to locate your life, you got to locate Christ. And when you locate Christ, the Bible also goes on to say in the very next verse, that when Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then shall you appear with him in glory. So your life is hid with Christ in God, and Jesus' life is your life. Now, this is something that, again, is a reality. But for it to become a reality to you, you've got to get this revelation, meditate on it, think on it, believe on it, abandon yourself to it until it becomes real to you. Because until it becomes real to you, it's not going to become manifest to you, or in you, or through you. Amen? So, again, this scripture here, again, Christ, say Christ is my life. He is my identity. Amen? And we have to believe that. He is, so you look in Jesus, and when you see him, having conquered all things, when you see him, see yourself in him. See, when you see his nature, when you see his love, when you see his faith, when you see his joy, see that that is who you are. That's what's happening on the inside of your spirit. It's as if he is a mirror 
of who you are on the inside. And that should not be a surprise because he is the word. And the word is the mirror. Amen? And with the word reveals what's in, inside of you. There is this scripture I find in, in Galatians chapter 4. It says, because you are sons, Galatians 4 and verse 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. So who came into your hearts? The spirit of your son. And Jesus says, as he is, so are we in this world. Now, we believe that. We must believe that. We need to believe that. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, so everything we need, we already have. Everything that God is going to do in the church, everything that the church needs, all its provision, all its resources, talents, all of it has already been provided. It's already done. And... As Jesus is, so are we in this world. Jesus is an image copy of who we are, or we are an image copy of him. Now, you can't really know what's going on in your spirit by what you feel in your flesh. You can't know what's going on in your spirit based on what, on, on what, on what your emotions are telling you. The only way you know what's happening, you can't even see your own face except you look in a mirror. Isn't that right? Well, you cannot see your spirit unless you look into the mirror of the Word of God. The Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 25, uh, verse, verse 24, He who beholdeth himself, and it says, okay, If any man be a hearer of the Word and not a do of it, he's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass or in a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetted what man of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, the perfect law of liberty, into the perfect law of liberty, to that which produces the liberty that is already yours in Christ. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed, but you need to know the truth to be made that free, to be made free, to have it as a reality to you. So the, uh, he that looketh into this perfect law of liberty, which is the mirror, and continues in what he sees, not being a forgetful hearer, not forgetting what he sees, but staying in line with what he sees, this man is going to be blessed. This man is blessed in his deed. This man is going to be supernaturally empowered to prosper. Amen? The, in other words, this verse of Scripture says, the person who looks into the mirror of the Word of God, which is the perfect law of liberty, and continues to see what the mirror is saying and what the mirror is reflecting to him, and continues to see who he is, and continues to see what he has, and continues to see who God is, and his relationship to God, and what God is to him, and what the Spirit of God is doing within him. As he looks into this perfect law of liberty, and he gets a clearer picture and an understanding of the reality of the things in the Spirit, that man is empowered to succeed. That man cannot fail. Can you see that? Amen? Now when you begin to see and grasp and adhere to what is in that mirror of the word of God, which is a revelation of who you are in Christ, which is a revelation of Christ himself, when you begin to see that, that's faith. Faith helps you to see what God sees. Now, and it is that faith, that seeing what God sees, thinking in line with God, believing in line with the word, speaking according to that word, and then acting in according to that word, that is what will cause the reality that is yours in the realm of the spirit to come into the natural realm and show up. And that's what Jesus says, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth, and that truth will make you free. It will bring you, it will make the reality that is so in the spirit become a reality to you indeed. Amen? All right. So, there is an issue then, of faith. And the negative side of this is, if you do not see in line with God, if you do not believe in line with the Word of God, you're either in faith or you're in unbelief. Or rather, you could be in both. I'll come back to that. But if you look into the Word of God, and you are not seeing what the Word of God says in your heart, you're not believing it, then what is already yours will not become yours in manifestation. That's a harsh truth, isn't it? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4 and let's see some of that. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 4. 
Now, the Bible has, has said back in Hebrews chapter, chapter 3. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 3. Let's back up to verse 12. Back up to verse. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about unbelief just for a few moments. Uh, unbelief is an enemy to your faith. And, and I'm going to talk about unbelief because we must eradicate it in our lives. Look up here for a moment. Let me give you, give you this here, this picture. Here you, have, here you have this table. Amen? And you have a horse tied to this side that pulls the table that way. That horse can pull up to 2,000 tons. But, and that horse is called faith. But on this side, you have a next horse. And he can also pull 2,000 tons. But he's pulling it in the opposite direction. And that horse is called unbelief. So you have faith operating and unbelief operating at the same time. What is, and they're pulling in the opposite direction. Is this table going to move? No. It's not going anywhere. Is it because faith is not available? No. It is because unbelief is present. So what should we do? We should try to, as I said, kill this horse. Amen? Get rid of that unbelief. That's what we need to do. Amen? Now, if the unbelief is operating and that faith is not operating, then it's even worse because what direction are you going? Darkness. Destruction. All right. So let's talk about this unbelief for a little bit because, you see, you know, people think you're either in faith or you're in unbelief, and that's not true. The man that came whose son was... Who, whose son was um, Demon possessed and the disciples couldn't cast him out. And then he came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, um, you know, I brought my son to your disciples. They tried, but they couldn't cast him out. But if you can do something, right, please. And Jesus said, don't, don't put it off on me as if I can do something. Let, let, let's bring it back to you. If you believe, all things are possible to them that believe. If you believe. And then the fellow the fellas recognized that Jesus was putting it back on him. And he says, you know what? I do believe. Help my unbelief. In other words, I do believe. That's why I brought my son all the way to your disciples. Because I did have some faith. And I still have that faith. But the problem is, there is also unbelief present. And Jesus says, okay. All right, let's deal with it. Amen? In other words, in that man, he had both faith and unbelief present. It is very possible. And it is quite often the case that we have both present. And that is why... God wants us to learn to shut down unbelief. Amen. So in Hebrews chapter 3, reading from verse, 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 verse um, 9, it says, talking about the children in, in, in wilderness, they tempted God and, the, and they saw his works 40 years. And he was grieved with that generation. And he says, they do always err in their heart. They do always err in their heart. Now I'm going to go on to say in a little while that all that is ours in Christ, look at me again, all that is ours in Christ, or that reality, all the blessings, all that is in your spirit, for it to come into manifestation is going to take faith. It's going to take believing. The Bible says when you believe, you enter into the rest. When you believe, you enter into the finished work of Christ. When you believe, you enter into that which is already done. Amen? And, um, and, 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 um, and he that believe it have. So I'm going to end up talking to you about believing. Now when I talk to you about believing... Right? I will also say how it is to believe in that, and about believing and about faith. So to pull this stuff down, when we talk about that, we're going to talk about believing. We'll talk about believing in your heart. Not just in your head, but in your heart. With a heart man believe it unto righteousness. And with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. Belief must be, believing or belief, you got to believe in two places. Your heart and in your mouth. Both places, not one and without the other. The Bible says in, again in Romans chapter 10 and verse 8, the word of faith is near you, even in your heart and even in your mouth and in your heart. Now, I was, as I was thinking on that scripture, the Lord helped me to see, and I'm just presenting this to you, I'm not trying to prove it right now. The Lord made me see that salvation, wholeness, preservation, deliverance, whatever it is you're desiring, it is near you. It is so close. And it really is because it's in your spirit. Couldn't be any closer. It's near you. However, it's going to take believing in your heart and in your mouth. Say two places. In my mouth and in my heart. 
Jesus says, Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. So you got to believe both in your heart and in your mouth. Romans chapter 10 um, says, um, verse 10, With a heart, man believe it unto righteousness. With a mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So I'm going to talk about believing. Because that's going, what it's going to take for you to enter into the rest. For you to enter and take a hold of what is already yours. To, push, put, to pull that, 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 that reality that is in the realm of the spirit and make it a reality in your life. Because it is a reality in your life. But it might not be a reality to you until faith comes. Amen? Amen. Y did you understand that? All right. So, in Hebrews chapter 3 then it says, God, God says, these people, they tempted me... And they, 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 um, where was I? These people, verse 10, they always err in their heart and they have not know, known my ways. So I swear in my wrath. Now, God swear. Do you know what it means to swear? What does it mean to swear? Right? We used to have a saying, not over my dead body. You ever heard that statement? To swear means uh, what I'm saying is going to be that way. Even if it takes me dying, it's going to be that way. In other words, when you swear, it is real absolute. And God swore. And the Bible also says in Psalms 89 and verse 34, God says, my word is like a covenant when it comes out of my mouth. And I will not alter it. I will not change it. You know, people might say God can do anything. Well, God has the ability to do anything. But God can't do anything. Because God, God is restrained by his word. God will not violate his word. If God says you got to resist the devil, then God will not resist him for you. Are you with me? Right? So God, does God have the ability to resist the devil on your behalf? I'm sure, I'm sure he does. But he wouldn't do it because his word says you resist the devil. Are you with me? So when God says something, that is how it is. And in this case, he says, I swore in my wrath. That means he said it with intensity. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Can you imagine God spoke the world into existence? God spoke certain things. And I don't think God necessarily was that intense. But here there is intensity. You better believe that they say so. What did he swear? They shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. God says unbelief is evil. Unbelief is evil. I believe unbelief is more evil than murder. On rape, on a bunch of other crimes. You say, how can I say that? Because the person who commits all kinds of hideous crimes, like a Hitler, if he would repent, if he would believe on Jesus, he'd still make it to heaven. In other words, God is saying, but if he doesn't believe in Jesus, what happened? Where does he go? He goes to hell. It's as if God is saying, that to not believe in my son is worse than any crime or any sin than any other sin that you could commit. To not believe in Christ, to reject my son, is worse than murder, rape. It is worse than, than, than annihilating and killing and mutilating every human being in all of Ontario. To reject his son. His son that in his infinite holiness chose to become sin that was so despicable to him and went through such enormous sacrifice that was beyond the measure of any sin, any adultery, any murder. He who did all of that to reject him, God says is worse than any other sin that you could ever commit. And it is unbelief that takes people to hell. Amen? So unbelief is evil. Is it? It is evil. It's very, very evil. To, un to have unbelief where the works of Christ are concerned is to ignore what Jesus has done. It is to ignore what his blood has bought. It is ig to ignore the price and the penalty and what he went through to make these things available to us. It is to ignore. You see, if I sit here today and I act like if you're not here, I don't acknowledge you. I just totally ignore you. That would be rude. Amen? But the Bible says, 
you, in Philemon verse 6, that your faith grows, becomes productive, and it produces, and it works as you acknowledge every good that is in you in Christ. As you acknowledge all the good things that God has provided for you and placed in your born-again spirit. When you acknowledge it, when you recognize it, when you own up to it, when you do not ignore it, if you pretend that it is not there, it's rude. It's as rude as me ignoring you. Amen? And not only is, it is also stupid because you will, not be, you will not be accessing or harnessing or taking advantage of the resources that Jesus' blood has bought for you and I. Can you see that? Is that important? So unbelief is evil. So these people were kept, the Bible says, so God swore that because of their unbelief, they're not going to enter into the promised land. They're not going to enter into that which I've already done for them. They're not going to enter into the finished works. Now it goes on to say in Hebrews chapter 4, right? and, and, well, and you need to read through the whole thing, but you'll see in verse 18 it says, To whom swear he that they should not enter his rest, but to them that believe not. This phrase and this thought is mentioned maybe about five, six times between chapter 3 and 4. The issue of the fact that God swore they're not going to enter into my rest because of unbelief. Because of unbelief. Now we're going to end up in a point where we want to say, hey, you need to believe in your heart and with your mouth. Amen? They erred in their heart. We're not going to. Amen? So we see that they could not, in verse 19, they could not. Not they would not, they could not enter in because of unbelief. The reason they died in the promised land, they died in the wilderness when the promised land was already given to them is because it wasn't because God killed them in the promised land. But it is because they could not enter into the promised land or into that which God has provided into the finished works of Christ in our case because of unbelief. So we cannot afford unbelief because unbelief means that you will not have manifested in your life that which Jesus Christ has purchased for you and that which is already in you in your spirit. It just ain't going to come out. It's not horrible, but it is the truth. Amen? So I say I hate unbelief. So it says, let us therefore fear, lest a promise be left us of entering into his rest that any of us should come short of it for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them because it was not mixed with faith. It was not mixed with believing. It was not mixed with believing and acting on what God had said. For, he, for, for we which have believed, we do enter into that rest. Amen? You do enter into the rest. And the rest is the finished work of Christ. Because the Bible says God rested on the seventh day, indicating that it was finished. So the very word rest, and he says that we are to, uh, the, 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 the Sabbath was the fact that God had finished his work, and so he rested on the Sabbath. He wasn't tired. He didn't run out of ideas. He had finished what he was doing. So rest has to do with the fact that it is finished. So to rest in Christ is to rest in that which is finished, to rest in the finished work of Christ, the finished work of your healing, the finished work of prosperity. And believe it in your heart, believe it in your, think in line with it, believe in line with it, talk in line with it, and see it come to pass in your life. Amen? Hallelujah. For we which have believed, we do enter into the rest. As he said, as, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, those unbelievers, but that's not us. Although the works were finished from the foundations of the world. And when he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Amen. So there is, def so there is this dangerous element of unbelief that we absolutely must guard against. However, the and because again the Bible says that if a man, and again he said that if because of unbelief they could not enter into the promised land. Because of unbelief, you cannot enter in to the fulfillment of the promises and the finished work of Christ. James said the same thing when he says, if, if any man lack faith, let him, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask God. 
But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, because he that wavers is as the wave, tossed to and fro. Let not that man, that wavering man, think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Amen? Hallelujah. And again, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because they that come to God must what? They must believe. Say, must believe. Now, where must they believe? In their heart and in their mouth. Amen? Belief must be in both places. So he says, without faith, it's impossible to please God because the way faith operates, when you come to God, you believe that God is a rewarder. That means you believe that God is good. You believe that God is a giver. You must believe that God is a rewarder and of those that diligently seek him. That God is and that he is a rewarder. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right. So faith needs to be in two places. Now, here is the awesome, here's the awesome truth. Now turn with me. Glory to God. Yeah, okay, turn with me. Let's go to Mark chapter 11 for a moment. Now I know you've seen this many times before, but let's look at it again. Mark chapter 11. Glory, hallelujah. Mark chapter 11. Now you know the story with the fig tree. Jesus cursed the fig tree. And he cursed the fig tree from its roots. And he says, he says, no man eat fruit from you hereafter forever. And the fig tree withered up from the roots. When the disciples saw it the next day, they were marveled that the fig tree which Jesus had cursed had, uh, had withered and was withering from the roots up. And so they marveled. And Jesus turned and said to them in Mark eleven twenty two, 22, have, and Jesus answered, let me, let me read verse 24, 21. Peter calling to remember said unto him, Master, look, the fig tree which you curse is withered away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Now, may I pause for a moment and, 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 and say something. Apparently the Greek scholars have concluded that this verse is more accurately written as having as have the, have, have the faith of God. Say faith of God. Other translations might say, have the God kind of faith. But I like the God, the, the faith of God. Amen? And then Jesus went on to explain how the faith of God operates. How the God kind of faith works. He says, you got whosoever shall say to this mountain, be removed, be cast in the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, that shall believe in his heart, that those things we say it shall come to pass and say it, he can have whatever he say. Amen? So Jesus says, this God, a kind of faith works, but you got to have faith both in your heart and in your mouth. Amen? Now, Jesus was talking to people that were not born again at that time. Amen? They were not born again, were they? They were not blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, Christ. God has not dealt to every man, every born again person, measure faith. Those scriptures didn't apply to them. We have the same spirit of faith. We believe and therefore speak that Paul talked about. That didn't quite apply to them. But yet Jesus spoke this to them. Jesus tell them that this is how, and, and Jesus gave us a great lesson as to how the God kind of faith works. But he says have the faith of God. Now, let's turn to Galatians. No, Romans, where am I? You know, let's go to Galatians, sorry. Galatians chapter, no, Ephesians, Ephesians, Ephesians. Ephesians, what is happening here? Glory to God. Ephesians chapter 2. So, now, the Bible says, as you know, in Romans chapter 10, that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How are they going to hear without a preacher? How are they going to hear without a preacher? But then God says, and how shall they preach except they be sent? But then God also says in Romans chapter 10 verse 17, when the preacher preaches the word of God, faith cometh. I like that. Because that says that I, there, there's a, God says that here I am making a promise. The same way he swore on belief, you're not going to enter into his rest. So he also says, when the word of God is preached, when that anointed word is preached, God said, faith cometh. Faith cometh. I'll take care of that part. You just go preach the word and faith will come. Amen? 
All right. Now in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, for, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. So it says salvation came as a result of faith. Well, where did they get a faith from, for salvation? When the preacher preached the word that Jesus died on the cross, who was raised up from the dead, and whoever believes in him can be saved, all your sins are forgiven, and so on and so forth. When they believed that, when they heard the word of God, faith came, and they acted on their faith, and they tapped into the grace, and salvation became theirs. Are you with me? So they were saved by grace, not because of their works, but through faith. True faith. Now, let me, let me put it this way. So the preacher preached what was already so. Jesus died on the cross, and faith came. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. I don't want us to turn to it. But Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. Yeah, turn to it. Hey, we're teaching. <laughs> Titus chapter 2. Titus, that's just before Hebrews. There's a little tiny page called Philemon, but just before Philemon, there is Titus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. Now, uh, I don't know if you still have your, your finger at, at, at Rome, at um, Ephesians chapter 2. I hope you do. All right. <laughs> Okay, because let, let's look at something here. Ephesians chapter 2 says, You are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift, not of works as anyone should boast. Titus 2 verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So the grace of God that brings salvation, grace has appeared that brings salvation. Grace that brings salvation has appeared to how many men? All men. Saved and unsaved. It has come to all men. There's a scripture in Romans chapter 3 that says righteousness has come to all men. It's available to all men. But it will only come into the lives of those who believe. Salvation has come to all men. The grace that brings salvation has come to all men. God so loved the whole world that he died for every person. Even the ones that are in hell right now. Salvation was available to them. But until you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that salvation don't come to you. But let me ask you something. Was salvation a reality before they believed in Christ? Before the sinner believes in Christ, is salvation a reality? Yes, it is. Amen? The same way your healing is a reality until you believe it becomes a reality to you. All that God has placed in your spirit is a reality. But until you believe, it won't become a reality in your life. Can you see that? So salvation was a reality before they ever believed. Now let me ask you something. You agree with me? Yes, salvation was available before, before, they, before they believed. Did salvation belong to them? Did they have a legal right to salvation? Did they? Does every sinner have a, every human being have a legal right to salvation? So in a way, salvation belongs to every single one. However, until they hear the word of God and faith comes for them to believe in a Jesus that they cannot see, right, and accept him as Savior and Lord, then, 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 then they can be saved. But Salvation belonged to them, and it was a reality, but it became a reality to them when they acted on the message that they hear by faith. So the gospel must be mixed by faith. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, you might, if I ask you when were you got saved, you ask me when I got saved, I would probably say, well, I was saved on the 27th of July, uh, 1982. And you will say you got saved on this day, on that day. And many times people will tell you when they got saved. But do you know something? Technically speaking, that was the day you received your salvation. That is the day when salvation became a reality to you. But in actual fact, you were saved 2,000 years ago. Are you hearing me? I'm trying to get a hold of this same point. That it's already yours. It's already a reality. It's in your spirit. But it is faith that makes it a reality in your life. But I'm also trying to say that with unbelief, if you do not... 
operate in faith and believing with your heart and with your, in the right way with your heart and with your mouth, then it doesn't become a reality to you. Amen? All right. So, Ephesians chapter 2, let's go back there, says, You are saved by grace through faith. That not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Now, certainly it means that you were not saved based on your works, that salvation was a gift of God. But I believe this passage, if you, you can also read, for by grace are you saved through faith. Faith is the gift of God. Can you see that? Faith is a gift. It's a free gift God gives to you, and it comes to you when the gospel, when you hear the gospel, and you use that faith, you get born again. But you know what happens? Uh, you, know, you know what else happens? When you get this gift of faith, it is a gift of God's faith, of the God kind of faith, of the faith of God, God's faith. Say God's faith. And because of that, you now have this ability to believe the unseen. The same way you rejoice with joy and speakable, full of glory, and you haven't seen Jesus, you haven't seen hell, you haven't seen heaven, but yet you rejoice, you have got that same faith to operate on anything else that the mirror of God's word reveals belongs to you. Do you hear me? So, but the faith that you have, now this is what I was, I've also been trying to emphasize. The faith that you have is not some weak, frail handicapped, you know, um, what do you call it? Impotent faith. The faith you have is the faith of God with the, with the full potency of God's faith. Now Galatians chapter 2 and verse 21, 20 says, You are crucified with Christ and it's no longer you that live, but it is Christ that liveth in you. And the life that you now live, you live by the faith of the Son of God. The faith of the Son of God. Whose faith? The faith of the Son of God. Amen? God's faith, Jesus' faith. Again, it also says in, Galatia, in, um, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is true, the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God. You have the faith of Christ. Amen? And Paul said, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. That God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. In, in, in 2 Peter 1 and 1, 1 verse 1 I think it is. Peter said we have received like precious faith. The same kind of faith that Peter had. Amen. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 13. We have received the same spirit of faith. We believe and therefore speak. We believe in our heart and we therefore speak. The same spirit of faith. So we have the same faith that Peter had, that Paul had, that Jesus had, that God has. It's all the same, the measure of faith. And the faith that Peter had and, and Paul had and all other apostles had is Jesus' faith. We've got that faith. Now, here is the thing. When God says I've, dealt to every, when God says I've blessed you with every spiritual blessing... He did not say, I bless you with a portion or a sample of every spiritual blessing. But no, he blessed you with every, all that there is. Amen? So he didn't give you just a portion of Jesus' faith. He gave you Jesus' faith. His own faith. He didn't give you a portion of the love of God. He gave you the love of God. He gave you joy above all your fellows. He gave these things to you and it is the full potency of it. It's full. Now we might not operate in it and the only reason we might not operate in it is because of the unbelief that tried to counteract it and it is because of the mind not being renewed for it to filter up through our soul. Amen? Are you with me? But it is the full potency. Now turn with me to Philemon. Philemon. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Say I have Jesus' faith. The full potency of it. Amen. You don't have no faith shortage. Amen. Glory to God. And Jesus says, with that faith, working right, believing in your heart and believing with your mouth, you can get a hold of the truth and bring the reality of God and make it a reality 
in your own life. Amen? Philemon 1 verse 6 says that the communication of thy faith may become effectual. The Amplified says that it may produce, that the communication of your faith would produce, that your faith would work. Your faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But here is how your faith works. Here is how your faith produces. This is what causes your faith to produce and become effective. Acknowledging every good which is in you in Christ. Acknowledging it, not ignoring it. Believing it. Saying that it is so. You know, you ought to read the Bible. And every time you see a verse of scripture with some wonderful promise. That, it, that in him I live and move and have my being, my sustenance. You ought to read that verse and say, I believe that in my heart. And I say it with my mouth, it is so. In him I do live and move and have my being. I believe it in my heart. And I say it with my mouth. I am indeed blessed with every spiritual blessing. And I got the full potency of God. Oh yes, I believe it in my heart. The love that is inside of me, it suffers long and it's patient. It's I believe it in my heart and I say it in my mouth. That's how it is. I believe it in my heart and I say it in my mouth. That I am filled with all of the fullness of God. Hallelujah. The fullness of God dwells within me. I am, in fact, and I will say in my heart that I do have the mind of Christ in my spirit. I do know all things in my spirit. God has given unto me prudence and wisdom. Christ has made unto me wisdom. I believe that. And I say it with my mouth. This new man, Colossians 3 verse 10, is created after the image of him that created him. It's created after the exact image of Christ. Yes, as he is, so am I in this world. I believe it in my heart. And I say it with my mouth. Isn't that awesome? Now, so this, your faith becomes effective when you acknowledge. Now, for me to, 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 to act, the, the mere fact that it says acknowledge means that it is so. If you acknowledge something that isn't so, then you're playing games. But to acknowledge, you acknowledge what, what, what already is the case. So this scripture in and of itself also says that it already is. Amen? So the communication of your faith becomes effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing that is in you in Christ. Now, now let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me make a shift. So on the one hand, I'm saying, yes, you've already got it. And I'm saying that your spirit is in the very image of Christ with all the potency in every single area and segment, love, joy, peace, just as Jesus' spirit, the anointing of God is in there. You don't need more power. Because God has placed his, the fullness of his power inside of you. The exceeding greatness of his power that he demonstrated when he raised Jesus from the dead. It is a matter of how do we appropriate it. It is a matter of how do we make it a reality. Bring it into this realm and make it a reality with our faith. And I've said that. But then I said there is this horse that we need to kill, unbelief. That is trying to mess things up. The evil heart of unbelief. But then here comes the good news. You do have this full potency of faith. And the way this faith works is you got to believe in your heart and believe in your mouth. Now, now let me say something else. When Jesus said in Mark chapter 11 verse 23, have the God kind of faith or have the faith of God, who was he speaking to? People that were not saved. They were believers in a sense, but they weren't saved. But you and I are born again, hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Now, and then you will find... Ah, glory to God. Thank you, Lord. You will find in the gospel, Jesus will say to people, Where is your faith? O ye of little faith. I haven't seen such great faith. And so on. Isn't that right? And the Bible will even say, and in the Old Testament, it will even tell you, Jesus will even say, Only believe to Jairus' daughter. Now, here is something. I'm going to say something. I'm going to startle you with this. So get ready. Ah, but this is so powerful. I, this had slipped away from me for years, but praise God, I got it. I ain't going to lose it. In the Old Testament, Jesus talked like that. Have faith. You of little faith. Where is your faith? Great faith. Only believe. Right? All things, are, and, and telling people, exhorting them to believe. Exhorting them to have faith. But watch this. In the, in the, in the epistles, and, 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 and uh, you know, check this out. Come back next week and tell me if you find any. You will not find any scripture in the New Testament where Paul or any of the other apostles in the epistles are exhorting the believers and telling them, where is your faith? 
believe. Only believe. You don't find that. You don't find that. You know why? You know why it's not exhorting them? You know why? Here is why. First of all, what you already have is a matter of realizing what you already got. But here's the reason why. I mean, I don't phone, you know, Justin is away at, 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 in university and, and in Waterloo. But we don't phone and say, Justin, you got to remember, let me exhort you, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you, let me remind you, you need to breed. Keep on breeding, boy. Do we say that? Why not? Because it ought to be natural to him. Are you with me? Well, you are a believer. We ought not to have to provoke you to say believe. Believe. Oh, believe. Believe. Have faith. Because you are a believer. That's why you're here in church today is because you're a believer. I'm saying this because let's get this struggle out of believing. Say, I am a believer. Say it again. So, it, uh, in other words then, the only reason why preachers will exhort and tell you to believe is only because the word of God is not a reality to you. If you knew how much the word of God is a reality, how much it is settled in heaven, all you got to do is find it. And when you find a promise, that's it. I believe. I'm a believer. Show me what it is that I might believe. You know, I, I, I like, um, uh, who was it? Oh, remember, remember, remember the, was, I think it was a Enoch that said, um, well, well, what hinders me? Oh, 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 oh you, 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 you were studying Isaiah and, and then it was Philip came up and asked, what are you reading? And he says, well, I'm reading this passage here in Isaiah. And, and, Peter, and he said, um, and then um, Philip said, do you, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how am I going to understand what I'm reading? Well, what, but, then he, but then he also was, was basically saying to Philip, come show me. Show me. Show me what it is so that I might believe. And then when he passed some water, he says, well, hey, why can I not be baptized? Well, in a way, we ought to be saying, show me. Show me another promise that I might believe. Show me what I got that I might rejoice. Are you with me? Say, I am a believer. I'm telling you, just getting hold of that is so awesome. So the pleading that Jesus had with the Old Testament telling the believers that, you know, oh, you have little faith. Oh, Peter got out of the boat, but the rest of you didn't. You know, where is your faith? Where, you know, oh yeah, we have doubt issues. Yes, we have unbelief issues, but we are believers. You don't have a problem believing. It is that doubt that tries to get in the way. It is that unbelief. Amen? And while I'm on that subject, let me say something else. God created you as a new creation. You are a new creation. God never created a failure. Never. Never. God, the new creation that God created is perfect. It is not a failure. Failure is man-made. Failure is man-made. It's not made of God. And if Colossians, um, Philemon says that if you would just acknowledge and take ownership of every good thing that is in you, your faith is going to produce, it's going to work, it's going to be effective. James says if you look into that mirror and don't forget what you see, but keep looking and keep seeing, letting a mirror talk back to you all the time, you are going to be blessed and empowered to prosper in whatever you do. Failure will be extinct. Hallelujah. Now, we need to close. So I'm going to close over here. Galatians chapter... Galatians chapter... 3. Amen. Glory to God. Aren't you glad you're here today? <laughs> All right, I am. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says, Christ had redeemed us... Hmm. Okay, I'm not going to read the whole thing because I'm only going to introduce something here. It says, Christ had redeemed us from the curse of the law, be made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on the tree. That the blessing, says the blessing, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. Jesus redeemed us from the curse, but he also wants the blessing of Abraham to come on the Gentiles, to come upon the heathen. But in verse 8, 
It says, God foreseeing that he would justify the heathen as the Gentiles through faith, he preached the gospel, which is the blessing to Abraham. So the blessing, now let me just tell you what the blessing is here. The blessing is what God had put on Adam so that Adam could have been successful. It is when God says, I bless you, God was empowering Adam by his very spoken words and declaration. God was empowering Adam to be fruitful, to multiply, to subdue, to have dominion, and to be able to take the Garden of Eden with all of its beauty and its perfection and, and take it like a seed and grow it and make the whole earth be filled with the glory of the Lord as the water covered the sea. And make the whole earth a, a, a Garden of Eden. Think about that. It was that power. It was that anointing to do that. I'll even go to dare to go this far. The blessing was the very power that God used when he said, Light be. And the sun wasn't created for a couple of days. <laughs> Until about the fourth day. When God created and spoke the, 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 the animal kingdom, the vegetables and all of that, it is that same power. Every spiritual blessing we're blessed with. Who glory to God. No wonder that we are going to be workers together with God. No wonder. I believe we're going to be co-creators with God with whatever he has planned for eternity. And it is the blessing. So God had the blessing. And that blessing was in Adam. Adam lost it because of sin. And that was sin over the tide. It was sin over the fact that God says, don't mess with this tree. This is mine. And he lost the blessing. God reinstated it to Noah. And his sons. He had three sons. Two of them never walked in it. Jephthah and Ham. Seth walked in it. I believe Seth walked in it. And Seth at one time was literally the only man on the earth operating in the blessing. Because Abraham didn't come yet. Or, or rather, it's, you know, Abraham came along after while, while Seth was still around, possibly. And when you do the calculation. And then there was a one day when and God made a deal with Abraham. And then God said to Abraham, I'll bless you. God, God, God says, I'll bless you and I want this blessing to operate in your life. And I want you to take care of it. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep this blessing going until Jesus could come. And God sent Melchizedek. And Melchizedek came. With, with, with wine and bread to Abraham and bless him. Now I believe, and, I, and I, I, I heard it before, but I believe it more strongly now, it's very possible. The Bible doesn't record who his parents and stuff are. But when you study it out, the Bible simply wanted him to be a type of Christ. And he was a type of Christ. But, but, but he was a real person. The chances are, Seth, the only one that was walking the blessing, is who Melchizedek was. And he came in his older age and he saw Abraham and he, and he said, here is, the, here is the wine, here is the bread, here is communion. And I've got something. The reason God sent me to meet you here is so that I might put these hands on you. Is that I might bless you. And the Bible says, he blessed Abraham. And he said, blessed be Abraham of the most high God, creator of the heaven and the earth. And he joined Abraham and God's name together. Making all that is God becoming Abraham's of the whole earth. The Bible tells us in, in Romans, I believe 4 verse 13, that Abraham was an heir to the whole world and so are we. And that blessing was there. Abraham got a hold of the blessing. Others walked in it and it was kept alive until Jesus came. And the, here it says in Galatians, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law that that blessing might come to us. And the gospel is the knowledge of this blessing, this empowerment, this enablement, this authority, the anointing, which is the manifest, which is the blessing in operation. The power to get wealth. The, 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 um, the, the blessing that, that would, that would um, to make you rich and add no sorrow with it. And that blessing, the Bible says, come upon the Gentiles through Christ. Because God made it with Abraham, sorry. He redeemed us from the curse of the law that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. And then it says, if you be Christ's seed, you're Abraham's seed. And then it also says, Abraham, that we got to have like faith as Abraham. And all of that I preach today comes to this point, that the blessing is yours. This empowerment to have victory, success, a Garden of Eden lifestyle, no sickness, no disease, no poverty, no lack, no, no barrenness, no insufficiency, all of that stuff comes with the blessing. But at the same time, like as we've been saying, it's another one of those things that is already yours and it takes faith 
believing it. Right? Putting it in your mouth, putting it in your heart for it to become a reality. Now that's where I plan on going, Lord willing, next week. Is in the area of to unfold and to begin to talk about that blessing. Because I know, because when we understand some stuff of the blessing, then you understand that you cannot be cursed unless you curse yourself. Because the Bible says that we could be snared by the words of our mouth or be held captive. All right? Amen? And people might try to curse you, but when we learn to operate in the blessing, you can bless what God has cursed. But we need to understand and operate in it. And that's where I want to go next week, Lord willing. Amen? Praise the name of the Lord God forevermore. Hallelujah!